staying healthy, staying sexy, staying young is what living life is all about. And if you have doctors that have proven treatments that keep people young and healthy so they don't get sick, um, you want people to know about these treatments and that they exist. This episode is brought to you by Gainswave. Gainswave is a treatment done at your doctor's office to optimize erection quality without the need of Viagra, Cialis. It's non-surgical, there's no needles, and it has an amazing success rate. To find a Gainswave provider, go to gainswave.com. That's G-A-I-N-S-W-A-V-E.com. This is Mark L. White for Health Hacks. And today we got Dr. Colin Dabrowski, who's going to talk to us about the feet. Um, welcome to the show, doctor. You're, you're known as the foot guy. What is it exactly that you do? Well, thank you for having me on. I guess I'll give you the, the quick rundown is that we get people back on their feet. I'm a Canadian certified pedorthist up here in London, Ontario, Canada. And I also happen to have a PhD in health science and uh, rehabilitation science. And so to that end, really what I spend my days doing are figuring out my individual's patients' needs and their puzzle, okay? To figure out what it is from a foot perspective, whether it's footwear, range of motion, mobility, orthotics, you know, referrals out. And then once we kind of get that figured out, really becoming passionate advocates to make sure they get what they need so that they can get back to doing the things that they like to do. For some people, it's, you know, crazy amounts of CrossFit every week. And for other people, it's just a pain-free walk around the block. And so we like to say from badass Olympians to octogenarians with arthritis, we kind of take care of it all. Okay, so why, like, a lot of people don't think about their feet until they have a problem. Yeah. Like, do, you, mm -hmm. do you agree with that? It's like, oh. the last thing I remind them is like, I can't walk, my foot's hurting, right? Yeah. What do you see a lot with athletes? Do you see overuse? I know you do a lot with plantar fasciitis. Like what's going on here? Yeah. So, I mean, most definitely I see a lot of plantar fasciitis. So half of my day is plantar fasciitis. The other, you know, third of it's going to be osteoarthritis. And, you know, the last bit of it is sort of everything else in between. And so, yes, from an athletic perspective, specifically, we see a lot of overuse injury. Now, whether that's going to be plantar fasciitis from doing too much too soon, too quickly, whether that's uh, some kind of a tendonitis around the ankle from the same thing, or whether it's a stress fracture because you changed your activity too quickly into something new that your body just isn't used to dealing with. We deal with a little bit of it all. So, so plantar fasciitis is where the tendon on the sole of the feet is overused or it's inflamed? Well, that's a great question. So there's a little bit of dis you know, disagreement in the literature right now in terms of what's really going on. And unless you want me getting into the nitty gritties of that, you know, it's, uh, we, we, we can or we can't, depending on whether you think it's appropriate. But to the end of the day, really, it's the fascia tissue on the bottom part of your foot that's been overused somehow, that's either been degraded a little bit, or you've got some acute inflammation. Either way, it's incredibly painful after long periods of rest. So oftentimes, people can be pretty active unless it's in the really basic acute stages. But it's when they get up first thing in the morning, it's like someone's taking an ice pick and ramming it into the bottom of their heel and they have to crawl to the bathroom in pain in the morning. You know, that, that's, that's what we see that, a lot. That, that doesn't sound pleasant. Now, I, I've read that shockwave therapy mm -hmm. is used to treat plantar fasciitis. Yes. Um, are you doing a lot of that to help people? Certainly not as a first line treatment. And so, you know, shockwave therapy is one of those things. So like a low dose radial shockwave therapy has been shown in some research in people who are recalcitrant. So people who are not um, responding well to conservative therapies works in about two out of three people, but that's when they just haven't been doing well sort of a year later. So no, shockwave isn't my go-to first line of support with plantar fasciitis. It's more taking care of that morning pain before you get up and breaking yourself out of a cycle of half healing and re-tearing. Because here's the thing, you know, there are a few big predictive risk factors for why people get plantar fasciitis. And if we look to some of the, uh, look to some of the research, it'll say having a BMI over 30, 
standing and walking on hard floors for long periods of time, and having a restriction in your ankle joint because your calf or your hamstrings are too tight. Those are some of the predictive risk factors, right? Once you have it, then you wind up in this cycle of half healing and re-tearing. So at night, your foot shortens, all of that fascia tissue starts to heal in a relaxed and shortened position. Then when you go to take your first 10 steps in the morning, you're lowering the arch, pulling the tissue, and essentially you're just re-tearing the half healing from the night before. And so where I really start with, with people who have acute plantar fasciitis is dealing with that startup pain. What they do before those first 10 steps can really make or break how they feel three to six months down the road. So, so if you're like me and you wake up at four in the morning to go pee, you're not really thinking, first of all, you're not really thinking at all. No. But how do you get, give somebody the awareness? Like what, what is involved in the plan? Is it a special sock they should be wearing? Is it just having that awareness of, I have to take care of my foot before I get out of bed? In the beginning, it's a lot of education, right? So it's, why do you have it? When are you the most sore? And how do we deal with that? So if your startup pain is raging bad first thing in the morning, then yes, if you get up to pee at four o'clock in the morning, you know, doing something is better than doing nothing. So even keeping a, you know, a really good pair of supportive sandals by your bed, like a Birkenstock or, you know, something like that, where you can get up, put your feet into those. You might not want to do all the exercises in the middle of the night, but if you could do something, it's better than doing nothing. And so from our end, you know, we're educators more than we are anything else. You know, uh, and we spend most of our time talking to people about, you know, what's going to be the absolute best thing for them. So, so is plantar fasciitis or I guess any foot, um, any chronic foot pain, is that preventable? Like, is that something I know I'm a, I'm a runner and what's important is I get the right type of running shoe and it helps me prevent my shin splints. It helps me yep. prevent any foot pain. Yeah. If people are aware of the things they need to do, does that prevent most, if not all, plantar fasciitis? It can prevent a lot of plantar fasciitis. But again, when you look at those predictive risk factors, if you're overweight, if you're standing on those kinds of floors, you know, if you're super tight through your posterior chain, that if a combination of any of those factors, if you, you know, start a couch to 5k program and, you know, you're doing hills work and speed work and all of that stuff way too quickly, then your risk factor definitely, you know, goes up. So it's a combination of how these things work together and mix together um, that that's going to make up whether or not you wind up with something like this. So you wrote a book called the plantar fasciitis plan. Yes. If you're going to, I guess, give somebody a 30 second summary of the plan, what would that plan be? Uh, make sure that you have the least amount of pain possible first thing in the morning. So, you know, we wrote that book so that people you didn't have to come and see me for, for me to give them all that education, right? It's, it's a, some basic home-based therapy stuff you can do that might help with your plantar fasciitis that's evidence-based before you have to go and see a specialist or after you've been diagnosed and you just don't know where to go. We see a lot of people with very poorly managed cases of plantar fasciitis that a year later, they're still in all kinds of dysfunction and pain. They've stopped their activity. They've gained 15 pounds. You know, they've, they've had those issues where all they needed to do was some simple stretching in the morning that no one gave them. So, so what kind of stretching is it? Is it like, um, is it just stretching the toes back or like what? Yeah, so it's some really tissue specific stretching. So when you look at the literature that it's been studied two different ways, that sort of generic stretch your calf up against the wall approach versus a real tissue specific based one before you get up in the morning. And it was found that the, the tissue specific one you know, had better outcomes than the generic one. So yeah, it's doing big ankle ranges of motion. It's bringing the toes back towards the shins. It's a little bit of arch massage. And once you've done all that, putting your shoes on before you take your first 10 steps is going to reduce how much you pull and strain that tissue. And so while I'll tell people, tomorrow morning isn't going to be 100% better, 
but it might be five to 10% better. And if every day you're not re-tearing it as much, that's when things start to finally get better. Because at the end of the day, you know, things like orthotics and whatnot don't fix plantar fasciitis. It's only time that fixes something like that. But if you can break out of that half healing and re-tearing cycle, people do much, much better, much, much sooner. Now, I have a Hypervolt gun. Oh, love those. So sometimes that I use them, and I think they're great for yeah. pinpoints. Does um, using a Hypervolt and doing that daily yeah. or doing that when you're starting to feel pain, are those helpful? Uh, in your calf and whatnot? Yeah, most definitely. You know, um, getting, getting it around your heel when it's really sore, might, you know, something like that might be a bit aggressive, but in your calf, uh, most definitely. Just be careful around your Achilles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how, how does somebody like, you know, you, you go to med school, you want to be a doctor, like why the feet? What does it, were you an athlete your, your whole life and you're having problems there? Did you have something that caused you to want to go in that direction? Yeah. So, so just to be clear, I'm a PhD, not an MD. So um, I went through as a research doctor, not as a medical doctor, that, that, that's a, a big distinction there. Um, but I was a patient first. So um, I was racing between elite and pro downhill mountain biking and wound up with a debilitating um, osteoarthritis in my hip called avascular necrosis. And then we think it was from either crashes or from stuff when I was younger, but I had my first hip reconstruction at the age of 17. Wow. And that, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, and that left me with a four centimeter or just under two inch leg length discrepancy. So you can imagine getting around with one leg two inches longer than the other one is kind of difficult on things like your low back. And it was someone like me that got me back to activity and that, that inspired me to want to do it for other people. Great. Um, and I know that you like the soles you wear in your shoes yes. are going to be important. I know sometimes when I wear the wrong shoes, yep. my feet are killing me at the end of the day. They're, yeah. they're shoes I love. They look great. Mm -hmm. They're uncomfortable. Yes. Is there a sole that you can put in these shoes or something you can do to make you wear the shoes you love without the pain? Nah, meh, not always. You know, it's really hard to out to, to you know out orthotic a bad shoe. And so, you know, we remember you said earlier that you're a runner and that you have to wear the right shoes for you so that you don't get shin splints. Well, I would really argue that you're probably not picking the right shoe, you're just not picking the wrong one. And so when it comes to footwear, so yes, we have, you know, 12 clinics in Southwestern Ontario, but we also have two really big running shoe stores. And in that people ask us the question every day, what's the best shoe out there? Give me the shoe I have to wear. Well, there isn't one best shoe, but there certainly are the wrong ones based on your mechanics, the way your foot is shaped and all of that stuff. So it's knowing how to avoid that is going to be sort of the best thing for you. Because once you look at, you know, Asics and New Balance, Saucony, Brooks, Hoka, they all make great shoes. It's really the question of which is the, you know, how does it match up with what you want to do appropriately? Yeah, like, so for example, for me, I'm flat-footed. Mm -hmm. I, I, my arch has somewhat collapsed. So yeah. any shoe I wear has to have um, arch support. Okay. So I know with running, it's like, where I go, they have me run on a treadmill and they're like, you need this shoe or that shoe. Yep. Now you have 12 clinics. Yep. What, are, how do those clinics help people? Do, you, do they help people with the types of uh, shoes they're wearing? Do they help people just treating the plantar fasciitis? Do you do everything? We, we tend to do a little bit of it all, yeah. So to that end, if someone gets referred into one of our clinics, let's say they have plantar fasciitis, for instance, we're trying to figure out, again, that puzzle. So what are all the things that they need to be able to recover from plantar fasciitis? You know, if they come and see us and they're six weeks acute, then we're probably going to look at, you know, how to do home-based therapy things, changing up their footwear before we go to something like an orthotic, unless they have significant risk factors, if they're diabetic or if they have, you know, really bad osteoarthritis in their knee, which is why they're compensating, which is what caused their plantar fasciitis, you know? And so what we do is we really look at those contributing factors, figure out how to mitigate them, and then give people the strategy for, for what they need to do to go forward. Are most of your clients that come in, are they mostly athletes who are having um, problems or just your everyday walk of the mill person with foot pain? I treat people from Olympians to 80 year olds with arthritis and everything else in between. Okay. And how big is the problem? You know, like, is this 10% of the population suffer foot pain, 5%? 
So plantar fasciitis alone, I think if you look at the literature, it can be up to like 9% of the population. So it's, a, you know, just with that one condition, you know, it, it, it can be a lot of people who suffer from foot pain. You know, when you go into osteoarthritis and diabetes, you just put those two things together in the U.S. population alone, you're talking over 100 million people. And so, you know, not to say that each one of them are going to have foot problems, but certainly can have, you know, issues. You know, diabetes and the, the complications that can come along with diabetes for your feet specifically, it's very important to be in the right kind of footwear to avoid uh, a complication that could wind up with you losing your foot potentially. Yeah, and I guess the other thing that I'm just thinking about too is um, when people... You know, people, like you're saying, lose weight. We have to eat better diet, but we also say exercise. But exercising sometimes is the cause of a foot problem because yes. they're exercising wrong. And I think also when people exercise, they don't think about strengthening the foot. You know, you think about, okay, my pecs, my biceps, mm -hmm. my abs. But I, I never think of like an exercise I can just do for my foot. I know you wrote a book called The Foot Strength Plan. Yes. Um, what are these exercises and should people be doing this you know, once a week, twice a week? Yeah. Um, as so needed? the foot strength plan came out of the need to, to help people to reconnect their brain and their foot. You know, by no means is it like the definitive textbook on all things foot strength, but it's, it's how to be able to get your brain talking to your feet better again. Okay. Again, I'm not a physical therapist. And so there are, there certainly are, you know, good avenues to go to look for that kind of stuff. But what we end up seeing are people who had an ankle sprain 20 years ago that never was appropriately dealt with. And then your, your brain's really good at telling your body, Hey, this area is, is sore. Stop using it, you know, as much. And then they, they do. And then they wind up with dysfunction down the road. So it's really being able to do basic things. Can you curl your toes? Can you fan your toes out? Can you lift your arch, keeping your toes flat on the ground? You know, there's some just those, those simple movements. You'd be surprised how many people look at me like I'm crazy when I ask them to do them. They're like, I, I can't do that stuff. And just getting them to be able to make your feet act like feet. That's, that's the, the real premise of the foot strength plan. I, I like that. Make your feet act like feet. Because I, I can't think of any, any other use than, a foot, than being a foot. So. That's it. Um, you talked about the um, stress fractures, and I know I'm thinking my wife. She had a stress fracture in her in her foot and didn't realize it, and just kept exercising and exercising. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything you can do for a stress fracture other than it's just you just have to have to let it heal? To time off. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing for stress fracture is going to be time off, and then um, and really ramping up your your your, your recovery. And so, you know, with anybody who's recovering, and this isn't stress fracture specific, this is just recovery specific, and not always the thing that gets talked about when you go in and see your doctor, but what's your sleep like? What's your nutrition like? What's your hydration like? Like, what are all the other factors that are going to affect your healing? right? From, from something like that. If you want to heal faster, you need to button those things up. Because if you only sleep four hours a night, you drink a ton of caffeine and eat a lot of processed food, you are not going to recover as quickly as somebody who has those things buttoned up better. Now, earlier you were talking about your hip and um, having hip replacement at 17. I, I've had bursitis in the hip, which is, is very frustrating. And, and sometimes I've had it so bad, you, you can't really walk but I also notice when I have bursitis or hip problems, um, my feet hurt. Okay. Yep. Is it because, uh, I guess it's because I'm changing the way I walk. Um, so when you talk to somebody, it's also about not just the foot, but other things they should be doing, whether it's their walk, taking care of other aspects of their body. Um, you talk about nutrition. Is there, is there a right diet that helps with the foot? Well, so, you know, I know enough to be able to say I don't know and be able to refer them to the ones that do. And so, you know, I'm not going to go down the minefield of nutrition because A, I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not educated to speak on that specifically. What I can say, you know, uh, uh, and be very confident in that is that there is much like there isn't one 
right shoe. There isn't one right diet and you need to find what works best for you. And whether that's going to be keto or paleo or, you know, whatever, all of those things you need to figure out with the proper person, what is that right thing going to be uh, for you specifically? And um, so we, we know enough to be able to say, hey, if this is where you're at, you, maybe you want to talk to a holistic nutritionist or a nutritionist or, you know, your family doctor, somebody that can help guide you in that particular area. But what's your vision um, in terms of like, what would you like to achieve over the next three to five years? Is it just getting out awareness on how to take care of the feed? Is it to make sure that everybody and you're in Canada, are you also in the U.S. or just Canada? No, we're in Canada. Yeah. So if, if is it just letting every Canadian know that there are other ways to take care of yourself? Like, where do you see this for yourself? 100%. What I want is so that people who have chronic conditions, people who have osteoarthritis, people who have diabetes, people who might have rheumatoid arthritis, we want to give them the best solutions so that they can stay as active as they want to be, do as much as they want to do with as little pain as possible. Okay. So it's just letting people know there is a solution. Um, I, I think what's also good is letting people who don't have foot problems know what they should be doing to just take care of it so they don't have foot problems later on. Exactly. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. I, I think this is interesting. Um, I, I see your daughter calls you Stinky Panko. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still don't know why. She came up with that out of the blue, but she thinks it's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it, it's funny because my daughter, I, you know, my daughter is a, a teenage teenager she plays lacrosse and soccer nice. yeah. and every time she gets in the car after a game and she takes her shoes off it's like that you know i just want to roll down the windows i'm about to pass out it's like the worst smell ever is there anything people should be doing about smells or anything there or well so you know here's the here's the one thing too is that you can look at the uh, um uh of the material of some of the sports equipment so some of that stuff just holds on to body salts and oils like crazy and it get it just stinks fast so you know when you have some of the six some of the synthetics like polypropylene and whatnot uh can really smell bad really really quickly and so with that there are some specific washes that you can use uh, i'm a big fan of some of the more natural things like smart wool for instance so marina wool um, is, is phenomenal because it's not that scratchy, itchy wool. It dries naturally from the inside out. So it keeps your foot, the sock will be wet, but your foot will be dry. And they're not nowhere near as smelly as some of the synthetics. It's, it's funny how, um, you know, when you think of your feet, you think of all types of things. Like I'm thinking of toe fungus and thinking of everything. So you take care of it all. Um, so on the fungus side, no, we don't, no. So I deal a lot with the biomechanics. Uh, but I don't do fungal infections, corns, calluses, plantar warts. We refer that stuff out to a podiatrist. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate your time. This is interesting for me. Um, I think it's going to be interesting for our audience because they all have feet, or, mm -hmm. or at least I, I hope most of them have feet. Yeah. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure.